What's up, guys? Welcome back again for another podcast. Today we're joined by Guy and Ian. These guys are from Cedia. Today we're going to be checking out the new... Well, I don't know if it's new. I think it's been around for a while. The uh, Cedia Designer, which is essentially some software that is, uh, I guess, browser-based, online-based, which you can use to design your, your home theater. And I will let Guy tell you more about it because I've only used it for maybe a couple of hours. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. And thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, this will just be a quick demo, really, a, a you know, brief introduction, really, to what, what's really um, been a journey of, of perhaps five or six years. So, um, you know, I, I'm obviously an integrator in the UK. You can probably tell by the accent. Um, been involved in this industry for, for probably a little over 22 years now. Uh, my background is electrical engineering, but uh, I found myself as a kind of in that Cedia channel, um, building a lot of high-end theatres and being involved in Cedia, um, volunteering. So I've been an instructor for Cedia, a judge for Cedia. Um, I've also been part of standards development for Cedia, so white papers, codes of practices. Um, you know, all of those kind of things came to a, a, a point really when um, I suppose immersive audio was in its infancy I'd, I'd finished doing a couple of big cinemas one particularly for a film director um and you know i, I was asked to go and do some talking uh, at dolby for immersive theaters and and the thing is i think at that point I'd, I'd i felt a little bit of trepidation because you know i i perhaps didn't know as much as i should i was i did a lot of investigative work about the different formats whether that be you know, Dolby Atmos or O3D or DTSX. I looked at lots of different um, technologies, lots of different deliverables. I looked at the best way to design those theatres. So looking at polar arrays and Cartesian arrays, those things about, um, you know, uh, you know, where's the best place to put these speakers? What's the best, best way to do it? Um, and so I started, you know, in the background, really, to come up with some calculations and computations through CAD drawings, really, we, we had the idea really of, of maybe sitting in a seat and shining a torch where you wanted to see speakers. What's the best way to do this? Um, being part of the CEDIA judging as well, I, I knew that documentation, you know, that the, the D in CEDIA just stands for design. So I looked at that documentation side of things and I just thought, um, what's the best way for integrators to, to produce you know, the, the correct, technically accurate documentation um, for their projects. Um, so margin, perhaps, you know, hey, I, I don't really like the term commoditize, but, you know, as uh, margins were eroded by, you know, quicker and easier um, technologies to both uh, obtain and integrate, I knew that really, you know, if you could sell your designs, if you could build a system and sell your design and make a really good margin on that design i thought that would be an attractive proposition for integrators so we set to work we we built um you know version one if you like 1.1 1 .1. Uh, i went out to the, the the friends fools and family you know those guys that you lean on first i went out to some manufacturers that i knew well uh, i spoke to some buddies of mine in the industry you know that i respect enormously so you know the, the likes of peter Ayler, tony gramani Rich Green, Kevin, uh, you know, um, Christian Bukes. You know, I, I went out to those guys and said, look, I'm working on this thing. What do you think? And ultimately, you know, I think everybody was fairly positive. Um, and then we got to the point of, of bringing uh, manufacturers into the tool. So loudspeaker companies joined us uh, within the database, as well as screen manufacturers, amplifier manufacturers, you know, all of these guys came in and uh, and thus it was kind of born at a commercial level, really. Um, it's really based on standards. And that's the, probably the one thing I need to ram, um, ram home today is that it's not just my version of events. It is actually the, the standards. So as you're going through the software, like it'll break it down from from like screen set, what type of screen you have, your room dimensions, the type of speakers, the type of projector or television that you got, uh, your room dimensions the kind of seating you have and then towards the well and room acoustics you plug this all in different sections and then you hit calculate then you get like a 3d render of your room which i believe you're going to show us give us a little demo yeah right? 
yeah, I'm going to run through that now. So, you know, an integrator would log in and you'd see the page we are now. This is, this can be done through a CDR integrator or, you know, you don't have to be a CDR member. You can, you know, use the tool. Luxury living, the first part of that is the modular micro LED stuff that everybody perhaps seen from Samsung It's it's uh, and Sony and the likes of, of those big display companies are, are building these, you know, 0.8 of a millimeter pixel pitch, this micro LED stuff, which is just fabulous. Uh, dedicated cinema room front projection screen. So that's what I'm going to show you today. That's the kind of uh, the top level, which we're calling Cinema Pro at the moment, Cinema Room Pro. Cinema, um, a media room with a drop down screen. So we're going to call this Media Room Pro. So let's just say most people have a flat panel display and perhaps they've you know triggered down a screen as well. And then Media Room, which is the very basic entry level, which is basically a, a flat panel display, 5.1 subset systems, perhaps, you know, that kind of thing. So um, mm. I'm just going to call this a, a demo. So the integrator would come in here. I'm going to work in millimeters. Obviously, um, you know, you guys would work in inches, but uh, I'm going to, you know, get a fairly big room. This is, um, you know, the dimensions I'm going to put in here, um, sort of 27 feet, uh, 21 feet, and probably a little over eight or nine feet, something like that. Um, would I like a baffle wall? I'm going to say yes. I'd like to put my speakers in that baffle wall, so I'd need that to be deep enough to house maybe subwoofers or front LCRs. Uh, and then I get to choose my codecs, you know, legacy codecs, Dolby Atmos. So if it's limited to DSP-based processing, you know, those kind of Denim Rants or Onkyo, um, Integras, uh, Pioneers, you know, those kind of things. Uh, they are limited in their um, discrete rendering of uh, audio channels. Mm -hmm. And then you get down into the other stuff here, which is probably people are a bit more familiar with, which is, you know, Trinovs, um, Acurus, Storm Audio, um, data sats potentially, you know, and certainly the SDP 75, which is, which is ultimately trend of technology from Harman. So I'm going to choose uh, anything above 11 channels. So rather than me just saying how many speakers are in this room, I'm going to kind of let the room decide. I worked with the guys over in um, Paris for a long time. So Arno Labriano, Destiny, Tom Garrett, uh, David Merovich, you know, they, they wrote a, a fantastic white paper to help, help do that. So once we're happy, I'm going to click proceed to codex. I'm going to drop this little thing down here and we just talk a little bit about the Sabine equation or the Sabine equation, which talks about RT60 time. So for those of you that know, you can have an impulse response and it's the time it takes for that clap of the hands or that impulse to decay 60 dB. So that's, you know, I don't like to use these phrases, but how live your room is or how bright your room is or how, you know, how, how much absorption you have in your room. So, so this will allow some integrators to, you know, to, to, to create what I'm going to call a fairly predictable outcome. You know, this isn't a fluid dynamic software, which is tens of thousands of dollars. This is just looking at, you know, have I got a room which is full of polished concrete and glass and it, it is it going to sound, you know, fairly predictable. So I would run through here. I'm calculating the RT60 over six octaves at 2.52 seconds. And then as I add, Let's just say on the front wall, I chose some RPG. Uh, I add some of this. I drop it down. I have some absorption on the front wall. I might have some two inch or fifty mil absorption. I'll and reduce what is, that. What exactly is in this these uh this drop down list here that you're looking at? So this drop down list really is a is a number of acoustical manufacturers who have opted to be in the database. So you know they've provided us with their absorption, diffusion, and reflection coefficients over six octaves. Um, and they've, they've agreed that they would like their products to be seen in the database. So, you know, whether that's Art Novian or um, RPG GRG Acoustics or, you know, lots of different manufacturers uh, mm -hmm. are going to provide us with their data. Um, and then once I keep, you know, adding some of these products, I might add a little bit of absorber diffusion at, at 50 mil and reduce some of this. And you can see in the top right hand corner that every time I add some diffusion or reflection, it will affect the RT60 value. So, I, you know, I won't labor this too much because it, it really is a little bit of um, uh, science and art, really. But it's going to get me somewhere to the point where I've got a, a 0.5 um, RT60 time. So if I choose, um, let's just say I want to add some of this. Um, I wouldn't put that there, but I just want to kind of press on, really. But you get the idea. And as I keep reducing the percentages or the area of that until eventually I get the RT60 that I feel that I would prefer. Uh, it isn't, you know, it is subjective, but, you know, you really probably want to be looking at around half a second, something like that. Right. And then once I'm 
happy with that and I'm not particularly, but just for the sort of demonstration purposes, I'll click calculate and, and move on from there. Now we're into the video side of things. So, you know, I've got a, uh, a client, I asked them, do you like movies or music or, or do you watch, um, I'm going to say um, sporting events, you know, what kind of aspect ratio screen would you like? So I'm going to I choose a 1.78 to one screen. I'm going to uh, put it into this area. I'm going to pick a screen menu, uh, a screen size. Now that size is really suggested by CB22, CB23 that says, you know, according to the screen height, this is how far away you sit. Obviously, you, you know, lots of people will, We'll just say I want the biggest screen you can get in the, and the most amount of seats. And uh, it's up to the designers really to steer people through that. Um, I'm going to choose a, a screen fabric. Then I'm going to choose a screen material. So I'm going to choose uh, a screen research with a Clearpix uh, 4K fabric with a gain of one and off axis viewing of 160 degrees. So uh, I'm not too bothered about anything else. It's just the engineered surface. Is it a true Lambertian reflector screen? What kind of attenuation does that offer to the high frequencies for those LCRs that reside behind the screen? And once I'm happy with that, I can move on. I'm going to choose a barcode projector and I'll probably choose something, um, a P3 uh, boulder, maybe with a sort of broad color gamut, something like that. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're, <coughs> you're, whatever you're picking, whether it be a projector or a speaker, if it's not in the list, you could still, you could still choose something, right? You can. Yeah. Um, certainly for, so for projectors, seats, screens, um, loudspeakers, you can have um, generic um, for, so for, for projector screens, you would use something with the gain for projectors themselves, light engines, you're going to lose uh, an overall luminance value. Um, and for speakers, you would use um, sensitivity at one watt at one meter. So how efficient that loudspeaker is. Right. Um, so moving forward, you know, you, I can fix my projector to the ceiling. I can fix it to a pole. I can motor it out of a lifter. Well, this projector is obviously too big to do anything like that. I can build it into a bulkhead and coffer, which I probably don't want to do with a, with a barcode like this. Um, I now need to choose my um, lens. So an EN60, um, uh, uh, sorry, an EN67 lens will give me a prime lens and it pushes the projector here. If I buy a, a 46 lens, well, that's not right. A 63 lens, again, not right. A 61 lens pushes me to the back of the room. And then if I have a, a 44 lens, it's putting me right on the end of that lens threshold. So I'm probably, if I'm going to use any ILS or, or lens recall functions, I'm probably going to want that to sit somewhere in the middle. So, um, And then I'm going to put the projector uh, through the wall. I'm going to build that into a room behind, you know, where I can manage its cooling and, and, and all sorts of other things. And as you're, as you're changing that, the diagram changes as well. Yeah, it's fairly interactive. So, you know, it's not a wizard. It's not going to do things for you, but it does give you some feedback, you know, and, and really the application of common sense. Most people could say, well, that doesn't look right. You know, that's not a great place to have a projector there. So yeah. it will it will let you put a, you know, a 12,500 lumen projector in the middle of the room. But, you know, probably common sense will prevail and, and it's probably not a great idea. So once we're into this area here and we're sort of we're through the video side of things. So we're into the, the seating layout and the, the loudspeaker layouts and those kind of things. So um, there is obviously calculated viewing angles for the main listening position to think about. There's the localization of loudspeakers. So how close your seats are to those loudspeakers. Um, you know, there are lots of, of different um, things to think about that this this sort of section of the diagram really does. So. If I can show and hide these baselines, I can turn these baselines on. These are called 25% lines. So to experience good base in inverted commas or, mm. you know, um, mean spatial variance and seat to seat uniformity, it's nice that you don't sit too close to a boundary, you know, too close to the back wall. So I'm going to select some seating. I'm probably going to choose something from Fortress, maybe. I'm going to choose a California range of seating. I may well decide to offset, you know, number fours looking, you know, to the back of number one's head. I might try and offset those, which is great. Um, I'm going to click this custom button down here and just bring the seating forward a little bit so that I get my viewable lines right. And I'm not in nicely in the sort of away from those 25% lines and things are starting to look a little bit better for me now. Um, and then Using this piece of calculus here, which looks slightly complicated, but, you know, don't be too afraid of it. 
uh, we've got the number of surrounds is equal to two plus the length of the listening area. And then we have the distance to the side wall, the distance to the back wall. So if you think this is the width of the listening area, this is the length of the listening area, this is the distance to the side wall, and this is the distance to the back wall. And then up here we have DC or distance to ceiling. So if I was to increase that plinth riser height, you can see that plinth riser raising. Obviously the distance to the ceiling has changed. So if I change any of those parameters, uh, let's just say I were to increase the gap between these chairs, obviously that listening area changes. Right. And the minute I do that, then I can click calculate and it will fire off a polar array and say, hey, this is exactly where those loudspeakers need to be. So it looks at, you know, zero degrees on axis to the center channel. And then it looks at minus 22 to minus 30 for the front left, minus 22 to minus, uh, sorry, plus 22 to plus 30 on the front right. It adjusts this median to a bisector. So it, it, it moves this front wide right speaker here into the hole. So, you know, to make that a little bit more seamless in the transition between the front sound stage to the surrounds. And you can see all of the trigonometry is done for the height channels as well. Oh, that's pretty cool. So uh, that kind of level of maths and calculations would probably take most people, you know, quite a, a considerable time. But to know that you're on axis to a speaker, that you, it, they are set out in the correct polar array. Obviously, if the room was really big and really wide, that polar array would then start needing something called a Cartesian conversion, which changes it from a polar to a Cartesian array. So there is a, a sine cosine converter written in there as well. And that, that stops. Would that change depending in, on what type of speaker you have there? Or is that kind of like a generic? It, uh, it does. Like... At the moment, these speakers are delivered on the center of their acoustic axes pointing okay. towards the MLP, the main listening position. A little bit later, if we have some time and if, if there's some um, appetite for it, we can talk a little bit about performance facts, which does talk in a greater depth about each speaker's individual characteristics, and uh, and that will get a little bit more in depth. But yeah. um, at the moment, it uh, inserts those on the centre of their acoustic axes. All right. So you know, once we're through this, and I, you know, I could, you could every time I move something. So if I were to um, just move those seats a little bit forward, everything disappears, and then I do need to recalculate again. Um, so that it keeps, you know, polling that and making sure everything's in its right area. So you could add more seats. You could, you know, change things around, increase the screen size, change the the code, you know, the um, the MLP. So at the moment, the MLP, the main listening position, the money seat, if you like, is number two. I can change that money seat down here, the MLP, to number, but you know, between five and six. And then when I click calculate. I have a slightly different layout, as you can see, you know, the front left and rights have moved further wide, uh, the wide left and rights have moved. So, you know, it will take into a consideration for any changes that you make, and then you just need to keep making sure that you recalculate. Right. Once I'm happy, I'm going to click confirm and move on. Uh, and I'm down into the next stage here, which is now I'm just selecting speakers. So currently, you know, most people will say, I'd like this range of speakers, but I'm not sure which model or which SKU. So I'm going to choose um, some Bowers and Wilkins, for instance. I might choose some CI Diamond Series and some 8.3s. And that brings their sensitivity in at one watt, one meter, 89 dB. So we now are starting to get an idea of the log equation of the, amplifi of the amplification requirement to drive those speakers to a certain level. So let's call that its, its performance objective. I would like my cinema to hit 105 dB with 3 dB headroom. How much amplification do I need? And how efficient are my loudspeakers? Now I'm going to bring in some more Bowers and Wilkins speakers, perhaps from the same range. I'd quite like them to sort of be tonally the same. And I might have um, the 8.3s as well. In the ceiling, I'm going to choose some Bowers and Wilkins. I'm going to choose some CI Diamonds. And then I'm going to choose some 8.5 Ds. So I've now selected my loudspeakers. You could go in there and say, I would like my left and right channels uh, to be different to my center. So you, somebody may well have an L and R, but a, a center which is on a pedestal in front of the display or something like that. So it will allow you to go and do those things. Um, large commercial theaters. I mean, I've designed theaters at probably over 200 seats uh, using TCD. Uh, timbre matching, timbre matching. 
is is you know the same mid-range drive units the same voice coils do the speakers sound tonally the same are they you know of the same kind of um you know tonal um characteristics mm -hmm. uh, and show all the speakers regardless of, of manufacturer so the manufacturers will say this is a uh, a floor standing loudspeaker but if i was to check this box it would allow me to invert that and put it on the ceiling i mean you know i don't suggest that you do but I don't like software that says you can't do this, you can't do that. So I do want some flexibility. So if you check that box there, it will allow you to pretty much put what you want. Where you want. Right. The last little bit here is we're getting into the the home run, uh, the home straight now, which is um, subwoofer placements. So you know, Dr. Floyd Tall Floyd wrote a book about sound reproduction, about where subwoofers should be placed uh, to to create a mean spatial variance and a seat to seat uniformity, which is acceptable. Um, uh, for every seat and listener so you can select your best subwoofer layout the best one i've found is d um, we've been asked by other manufacturers to provide us with different and even some of these have in ceiling speakers so, uh, sorry in ceiling subwoofers mm -hmm. so i'm going to choose d i'm going to say i want those in all positions i'm going to choose a bowers and wilkins uh, i'm going to stick to the same 700 series and i'm going to choose a couple of 50 of oh, sorry four 15 inch um subs down to yeah. the last little bit now, if you get some DIY subs, then you can, is there like a generic option? There is a generic option in speaker, um, not in subs currently, um, but that's something that perhaps we could look at in the coming weeks. It's, um, I've never been asked for that before, to be honest, but uh, it wouldn't take me too long to implement that. So um, Only because my, yeah. my subwoofer wasn't in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will um, take a yeah. look. Neither were my, were my amplifiers. Oh, what <laughs> amplifiers are you using? Uh, some Macintosh. Yeah, we are speaking to Macintosh at the moment. Uh, Macintosh, okay. there are some 347s and some 253s, I think, which are, and then they've got the MX100 and uh, I think 120s and 150s as well, which are going in. Oh, cool. Okay. And, yeah, I've got a 257 and, and a 255. To explain a little bit on that is because there's so much data that we need um, from the manufacturers to enter into the software to allow all of these calculations to happen, we can't go and scrape that data off, say their website, it's uh, it's definitely an opt-in. So we have to have the support from the manufacturer to supply us with not only the data, but also when you see the three-dimensional renderings, some of their 3D CAD files and things like that, so. Gotcha. Uh, so, so once we're into this last little bit, we're looking at discreetly rendered channel counts. So it's saying you can't do this on an eight channel turn off you know you need something which is 16 up to 16 channels so it kind of helps me select the right output card for the turn off you know the right um uh model uh if you were to you know have something which was 32 channels for instance it would say nothing else will do but that but that processor right. however you can override that you can say i'm just going to um have the same signal to each of these loudspeakers and i'll you know i'll put up with that but um uh, and then we're into the amplifiers. This is all going to change with performance facts. And if there is time and, and you feel there's appetite for it, then we'll talk about that a little bit later. But yeah. we're going to choose an eight channel amplifier. So it says you have eight, you need 19. I'm going to have another one of those. And now I know that I've got um, <clears throat> a couple of subs. So I'm going to choose some SA 1000s. And I'm, you know, each one of those will do two subs, but I'm going to treat them to one each. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then we're into the last little bit. So the last little bit we're, we're calling this kind of is the precursor to cinema grades. So if 10 people were in a room and we were all asked to build a cinema, the likelihood is somebody would come back with a flat panel display and a sound bar and somebody would build, would build a multi-million dollar post-production screening room. Um, because it's so subjective what a cinema really is. Unless I give you a performance objective, I would like my speakers to, I need my screen luminance to be, Unless we have these performance objectives, then, um, you know, it's all a little bit ethereal. So the idea of cinema grades, which is uh, another current thing that CDO are working on, which is really saying I need a level one to level four room and all of those have different performance objectives. So um, this would be 105 dB at well, 3 so dB. What, so what you're saying is sound bars are not in this in this anywhere. They are in it, actually. Oh, they, they are. are. Okay. They okay. are. And we, we, you know, we've had a lot of success with media rooms because obviously it started off as the cinema designer, but obviously it, it, we do have media rooms in there. 
uh, and Sonos particularly have an enormous amount of success with their soundbars in here. So yeah, wow, uh, okay. we do, but but obviously the performance objectives are considerably different to a, yeah. a pair of, pair of Maya sound blue horns or something. So um, I'm going to choose 97 dB and 1 dB headroom. So it's telling me I need 168 watts uh, to hit 97 dB and 1 dB headroom. And, I, and that's kind of within the capabilities of the amplifier that I've got. I may well up that to, obviously, it's a log equation. So you've got minus 6 dB per doubling of distance. Uh, so it's a 212 watts at 98 dB with 1 dB headroom. And once I'm happy with that, that's it. I can hit calculate. I've got a very um, uh, sort of dodgy internet connection. So I'm just hoping that I don't lose a connection whilst doing this. So um, it will run off to the TCD server. It builds a 3D model in CAD. And then it will start constructing the 3D visuals. So we're into, um, you know, what we're calling the immersive visuals as well. So the ability mm -hmm. to to look around the room. So I'll give you a quick quick look at that while that's doing that. So you can see this here. It will you can download a visual that you could then send to your client and have a look around the room. You know, you can see um, if your client is interested or you're interested in what that room will look like. You can download that to google cardboard put it into vr mode and um, mm. and you're off um for those that don't have cad and not everybody does there are open source cad softwares but but if you don't you can just click on this 3d cad viewer which is fine um i'm going to proceed to renders um which is which is here some people if you you know if ever, anybody's ever used google sketchup you know you can spend hours and hours and hours in google sketchup and it still looks like sort of egg boxes and cartons, you know. So uh, we hope that this is a, a little bit more uh, appealing. So I can choose different um, lighting effects, so starlit and coffers. I can choose um, different color seating, not that you would, but if you wanted to go um, into that. There are different kind of panels. I'll go to um, stretch fabric panels or whatever it is I want. And this is a good opportunity to explain to your client um, you know, how contrast ratio can be impacted by having white walls or white ceilings or yeah. um, so, so it's a really good, uh, uh, useful sort of educational tool as well. I'm going to cho choose to take a picture from seat six. Uh, I could change the screen grab if I don't have a glide escape or I don't do, um, let's just say I, I wanted something um, which was slightly different. And then once I'm happy with all that and I'm not particularly, but you kind of get the idea, I'm going to say click. Uh, and then move on to the dealer hub. And the hub is pretty much where every project I've ever done um, is. And this is my dealer hub. So um, once I'm done with that, I can download the CAD drawing. Oh, hold on. I can download the CAD drawing and I'll do that um, quickly now. Uh, and then it'll open this up into um, my CAD package. I hope. Perhaps I should have opened it slightly before. Now, is this strictly for installers, or can the end end user use as well? Just a normal person. Um, I would say, if you know, and although I'm in the in the industry, and I'm I'm a sort of a, an engineer doing this thing daily, but I would say that a, a fairly reasonably um, technically proficient person who understands what some of these numbers mean. Um, I think it would be great fun to design my own cinema at home using something like this. You know, if I was going to convert a garage or a basement, I definitely would use something like this. Um, yeah, it didn't, it didn't look, uh, when I was, look, I'm not the most uh, smartest guy in the world, but it wasn't that hard to use. No, it really isn't. Yeah. And, you know, I know Ian is keen that we don't use the term wizard, and I, and I do concur. It's probably not the best thing to do, but, but there is an, a, a natural flow to it. You know, you start at the top and if you're methodical and you work through it, um, the, the documentation that is output is brilliant. Imagine giving this to your architect saying, you know, this is this is what I'd like to achieve. So here's a 3D CAD drawing. So we can have the top plan here because it's built in 3D. You could say file save as top plan. Then you could say file save as front elevation. Then you could say, you know, file save has um, side elevation. And this will show you you know, accurate measurements of every loudspeaker plus their back boxes on where on where everything goes. So I'm just going to put that back into top plan. And briefly, if I show you a dimension, an, ang an angular dimension, and I click on the center line and the front right speaker. And then I move this up here and I double click on this. You can see that I've got 22 degrees for the central of the acoustic axis for my loudspeaker. So 
you know, it does give me a basis to start adding and layering on, you know, electrical outlets, sockets, HVAC, you know, anything I need really. So the first thing you get is a CAD drawing, which I find, um, you know, really useful. The, the next part here is a PDF, which um, is a, a, you know, it's about a 30 or 40 page, depending on the products that you select. So if you were going to do this for somebody else, you would send this to the, your client as a proposal. Uh, if you wanted it for yourself, it will give you some pretty quick snapshots of what it is you need to so the information that you need. So um, here are some dimensions, seating dimensions, overall room dimensions. Um, if you don't have CAD, it's really useful because it gives you the, some of the CAD dimensions. It, it grabs those straight out of the CAD drawings, um, plus the isometrics, plus all the seating distances and view, viewing angles. Uh, here we've got uh, the audio design stuff. So, you know, no coloration, soundstage, envelopment, dialogue, speech intelligibility, you know, focus. Um, so it talks about that. Here are the center of the acoustic axes for all the loudspeakers in 3D relative space. This is a... Um, uh, an SPL variant. So if I sit in seat one, row one, and I'm that far away from the front left speaker, I would expect 99.1 dB. Hmm. Uh, and row four, seat, uh, sorry, row two, seat four, um, is going to expect uh, 95.5 dB. So you can see that that this is going to give you uh, um, a, a max variance between seats and um, rows. Moving down here, you can see the speakers, so exactly the cutout I need for the speakers. It's pulled all that in from the database, the weight, the width, the height, the length, the ceiling stuff, the subs. Uh, and down here, the log equation for the amplifiers. We touched on that before, you know, this minus 6 dB per doubling of distance for, for direct radiating loudspeakers and minus 3 for line source um, uh, products. So I'm going to get 212 watts for 98 dB, uh, and then it will show me this sliding log scale amplifier, the other amplifiers you saw me put into the subwoofers, mm -hmm. uh, the Trinov, the altitude, uh, the user interface for the Trinov. This is the, 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 uh, the, the sort of input output, you know, the IO selection for the Trinov. So how many SPDFs, how many HDMIs, what's the weight of it? What's the rack you are AVRs in there? AVRs are in there. Yeah. We've, we've done an enormous amount of work with Onkyo and Pioneer and, oh, Mar Denim Rants. So yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of stuff in there. So um, per, per seating, like front row, second row, you mentioned it'll tell you how loud it'll get what the SPL will be. Is there like a max number that you're trying to achieve per seat? Well, well, the max number that you're trying to achieve really, you know, goes back to the, the conversation we had about performance objectives. So if, if I said to you, I'm going to build you a cinema that's going to give you 105 dB reference mm -hmm. in every seat with 3 dB headroom, and it's a really big room, yeah. then, you know, you're going to have to bring a lot of money to, to achieve that kind of level of performance. And really, this is a, a way of, you know, I'm not saying selling your your skills, but saying to your customer, look, you know, we we are better. And what does better mean? Well, this is what better means. You know, better is quantifiable, and there's there's a mathematic and an engineering uh, decision behind this. So, so if you so pop it, in, a, that's why we pop in. If you pop in an AVR and it's just underpowered, you can show them that it's it's not gonna it's not gonna cut the muster. Yeah, exactly. Room. You know. In the US, you know, it's different to the UK. You have much bigger spaces to fill. You know, right. if you're sitting three or four meters away, you know, 12, 14, 16 feet away from the front LCRs, and you're asking for reference, and people band that term around quite quite readily, but reference is incredibly difficult to achieve in yeah. really large rooms, you know. So, yeah, that, that little 100 watts a channel, um, uh, you know, three channels driven or something is not mm. going to do it. So gotcha. uh, this this part here is not, not complicated, but it, it talks about the first, second, and third length mode. So it talks about those fundamental length modes where you're going to experience good bass. And then obviously you've got the uh, tangential and the bleak modes, which are, are less important, but it does give you an idea of how that room is going to feel, uh, what the kind of um, mid bass and low end is going to feel like, which is really important. Video. So we're going to talk about dynamic range here, how black the blacks, how white the whites, color colorometry or color accuracy. So flesh tones and, uh, color gamut, you know, how many crayons, how many color do I, how much color do I have to play with? 
and then obviously last in that hierarchy resolution. Um, moving forward um, into the screen, the overall luminance of that screen, the area of that screen, um, you know, I can tell you that this, this, what that, how big that is going to be, that what the screen is going to look like, the fabric of the screen, the attenuation that that screen offers to the higher frequency. So anything over 10 kilohertz, what that, you know, housing a loudspeaker behind that screen, what that does. Um, the, the projector pre-calibrated, I'm going to get 47.1 foot Lamberts or 161.4 candelas per meter squared. So this is when you say, can anybody use it? This is the moment that you would say anybody could use it, but what do those numbers mean? So is 47 foot Lamberts good? You know, that's that's really left up to the individual. Um, uh, and then where the projector's mounted, the lens that you've chosen. Um, we talk a little bit here about target curve and acoustics and RT60 times. We talk about the impulse response and the decay after that impulse response. And then this part here is the reverberation time. So the RT60 we told you about um, the front wall. You just watch me add some absorption, do you remember, to the front wall. And then it will tell tell me that over 125 hertz, 250, 500, a kilohertz, two kilohertz and four kilohertz. Um, so what that absorption, diffusion or reflection coefficients are for those products. And then down here, the all important RT60 time, um, which is going to tell me how that room is kind of is going to behave. Um, you saw me add some products in sort of randomly without much sort of care and consideration, but it does bring these products in for me. Uh, and the seating, you watch me add some fortress seating. And then, um, you know, the room, but I'm just gonna uh, close that down because the other one has finished rendering. So I'm just gonna export that again. And it should give me uh, a much more accurate render because that, let me just roll down to the end. Um, you watched me add, you know, a screen and put some sort of uh, collage on the front of it. And then the seating in that kind of tiered format with the, the fiber optic lighting and the, the sconce or the trough um, through there. So this is a, a 39 page document that effectively you could just hand to your client as a sales proposal. Um, you can also export that document into Word. If you wanted to import your company bio or your awards or something that you've done, you can you can do that. Um, video calibration report. We are working currently with ISF, um, Joel Silver and you know the fabulous people at ISF. Uh, and this is really something that you may say, I'd like my brightness, color, contrast and tint, sharpness, uh, overscan, talks about color gamuts. And here, you know, it's very basic, but even tens, tens step RGB grayscale tracking where we're looking at um, you know um, small IRE windows uh, and you know this this kind of little calibration report is always quite handy to to fill in and leave the client and for those that enter CD awards it does tick that box. Audio calibration now most people will pull out the audio calibration report from the AVR or the pre-pro but for those of you that go old school and do it with them um, you know, audio tools or something like that, you may well want to just write in there SPL at one meter calculated and measured SPL um, and a few other little uh, bits. Uh, D tools, which for those of you that know, it's fairly big in our industry as a product um, management software. It will, it will handle pricing, local area pricing and those kind of things. So this will handle, uh, this will export a CSV file and allow you to any, you know, if you was to pick the room up, turn it upside down, and shake it, anything that fell out would would end up in this CSV file. Um, if there's an email, you can email us an issue. We we you know, I'm not just saying this, but we don't actually get that many technical emails um, anymore. We don't get any, hardly any. We probably get a dozen a year. Most of it is login issues. Forgot my password. Uh, I've made the room instead of putting nine thousand millimeters, I put nine hundred millimeters. Uh, and the seats don't fit in the room or, you know, those kind of things. So I'm not saying it's user error, but most of what we get now is just really guiding people through the minutiae of some of those choices. Um, if you want to edit a job, let's just say I've got a client that said, I like it, but I can't afford that projector, or I really like it, but we need to do something about um, the performance, then you should be able to log in and then just click this edit button in the top left corner. And that will populate that project for you precisely at the time before you click calculate and then you could go back in and either value engineer something out 
or up the specification and performance levels on other products. Um, you can click this admin render down here, which will give you, let's just call it a wobbly render. So this wobbly render that comes out is, is the, the render that gives you that VR image. Um, and then this is obviously your dealer hub. So this will tell you what project, what loudspeakers you had, uh, amplification and power requirements and uh, screen and projectors and calculated luminance. Um, and ultimately, every little thing that you want is all in this um, hub. So for, for, for professionals, it's a great place to keep all your projects. And for you know enthusiasts, DIYers, amateurs, or you know one-man bands who, who just don't have the resources to, to generate this level and quality of documentation because they're on a job site all day. So um, that, that was the hope for it. And it's it, it's been, you know, brilliantly taken up really so that's that's really a super fast demo normally it takes me about an hour to do those we, we sort of delve deeper into things but i mean that was as, as quick as i've done one i think sorry about that i was on mute so is, is there other softwares that do this or is or is this like the one-of-a-kind type of thing or is this like an industry standard type of type of program uh, I think there are, you know, you could go onto Projector Central and, and calculate your throw distance. Uh, REW is, is probably amazing at, you know, low frequency and base uh, calibration and setup. You know, I don't think you can get much better as a as a, a piece of software for those kind of things. But it, it, as a piece of software that acts from beginning, middle to end, generating CAD drawings, three D renders, um, you know, three D visuals, bills of material. Um, I, you know, I, I, if anybody tells me there is something like it, I, I don't know of anything like this anywhere in the world uh, and still now. So, um, yeah, I think the answer to that is no. Huh. And um, you were talking about something about performance, like when you put your individual different speakers in, does it calculate uh, the specs into the whole equation here, the calculations? Yeah, at the moment, uh, in the early days, when I first started this, obviously there was there was only sort of two or three of us. When we first started this, we're um, we're just using sensitivity of loudspeakers, you know, S, um, so one watt, one meter. So uh, it, it's fairly fundamental and fairly basic, and it leans, it, it favors heavily those people that develop very sensitive loudspeakers. But Cedia um, uh, and the standards groups at Cedia, so the RP22 group, the RP1, you know, all under the sort of Heady, uh, the, the tenure really of a guy called Walt Zerby um, are delivering something called performance facts. So performance facts will talk about the nutritional value of a loudspeaker. So think about a co can of Coca-Cola. As you look at it, it will say, you know, this much carbohydrates, this much sugar, this much. Uh, um, so it, particularly in the audio world, loudspeaker manufacturers are often reticent to you know let those numbers out really it's different yeah. in the video world because the video is much more quantifiable and and it's there's a lot less smoke and mirrors but um particularly the audio world so performance facts will talk about you know polar plots it will talk about off-axis response overall sound power horizontal and vertical um uh, off-axis frequency response it will talk about all of those things which aren't readily available to that they are in the commercial world but that level of um you know proper engineering not numbers if you like is, is just not that readily available so cedia are now uh, have embarked on really probably the first thing of its kind in in the residential market and we hope that feeding that into tcd will just be another game changer and as far as um I see where you plotted like subwoofers in each corner. Did you, did you mention that it'll tell you where your nulls are and everything like that? Or will it tell you exactly where you should put your subwoofers? Yeah, on that spreadsheet that I showed you, remember we spoke about the uh, the axial tangential and oblique modes. So those those first three length modes, those fundamentals, if you like, which are the most important, are plotted on that spreadsheet. So it'll tell you that, you know, most the rule of thumb really is, you know, double the room, divide it uh, by the speed of sound, um, and that's your first fundamental, and each one is, you know, is, is is a derivative of that. So we use that kind of 
um, basic mathematical formula to work out those first three fundamentals. So, um, but but you know, moving forward on our project roadmap, we'll perhaps show analog waveforms, you know, of amplitude and wavelength of, of where speakers are, these rising crests, if you like. So, will it tell you, or do you have to manually put in like for room acoustics? Will it tell you what would be the optimal place for room acoustics, or? for like panels and diffusers etc yeah that's that's a really good question and you've probably been on these job sites where people just screw fiberglass to the wall and tell you that the room's treated yeah. um but that does require a little bit of uh, further thought if you think about how a, a loudspeaker behaves it's you know like we spoke about it's horizontal and vertical off-axis response it's um it's directivity indexes you know all of those things really do affect um how that room is built and uh, and it, we're a little bit early to start telling people screw some diffusion there and and stick some absorption there but after performance fax is finished it will make that a lot more accurate for us to do right 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 awesome what else what else did you have is there, is there a place for like um non-symmetrical rooms um so this started as the cinema designer, uh, the CD designer. It started as as a, as a kind of a cinema designer. So if you think you've got a room with a dog leg in it, for instance, or a kitchen area, uh, you know, what we, what we tend to do is to build the room to all intents and purposes as a sort of a shoe box, as a Cartesian box in CAD, and then lift that room up and drop it on the architectural drawing because it's one-to-one. -one. So let's just say you've got a, a lounge with a sort of small dining area or a pool table and a bar area at the back the idea is is that you're you're building the cinema and then you're just going to drop that onto that space and because it's built one-to-one -one, um if you select the right scale you should be able to do that so you know quirky rooms with with odd um alcoves um would would prove not impossible but but incredibly challenging to to find every conceivable um iteration of that room that room and space so we opted for this method so how much easier, so if you were a, an installer, how much easier does this make their job? Like, how do they usually do it? Well, you know, I've done it and I, this is the one thing I do know about really. And if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a CAD guy and you're lucky enough to have a 3DS Max guy and you're lucky enough to have somebody who's a good cinema designer talking about, um, you know, room acoustics or projector specification or so there are probably three or four different people i would say it's, it's unlikely that you that as a company or an individual you have all of those skills but but if you were lucky enough to have somebody with all of those skills it would probably take days and we have done a time and motion study of this and it you know it would it would take five six seven days to create what you could do here in you know 10 minutes um so you know, it, it really is a bit of, in fact, I've had an, a couple of people who, who were cinema designers and they were consultants and freelancers who have kind of looked at me in a little bit of a, a quizzical way thinking, you know, thanks a lot. You've just sort of done me out of a job really. So, so what's the, um, so what's a, what's the uh, cost for this? Like if you were either an enthusiast or if you were like an installer, like what is this going to run you? There's a couple different levels. Um, for whether you're a CDA member or a non-member, um, uh, there's there's a price break there. You get a discount to be a, being a CDA member, and uh, if you're a CDA member, you get access to Media Room, which is the base uh, level for free. Um, and then from there it goes Media Room, Media Room Pro, Cinema Room, Cinema Room Pro, and then we also have um, so that's the structure. Um, and the the higher you go, all the way up to Cinema Pro, the more features you get, the bigger rooms you're able to. To design um, and then there's the ability to uh, pay per use pay per month or pay per year um, it's all on, on our website it would I, I don't want to go through the all the numbers but you know they start out um, you know media room starts out at you know non non CD members at 150 dollars per use 55 a month or 625 a year um, and all the way up to the cinema room pro which is 300 dollars per use 100 dollars a month or 850 a year um, uh, but if on our website, cdia.net forward slash TCD, there's some pricing structure there that explains the breakdown of the, the price plus the, the features you get um, from each one. Did you, did you say there was like a demo version of it? 
There's not a demo version, but if you are a CDM member, you do get access to the, the base uh, uh, subscription, which is Media Room for free. Okay. So um, one become a CDM member. Oh, that's easy. Uh, CDM.net, um, you can easily... Um, and we're actually changing this up. We're creating a new uh, form for uh, instantaneous CD membership application that should be launching um, within the next couple of weeks. Um, but just go to cd.net. Um, there's a, a link in the top corner that says um, join now. And that'll walk you through the steps. It's really easy. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it free to be a member, become a member? Um, it is not free. Uh, there are a couple different uh, tiers uh, of CDM membership for integrated, like integration companies, um, industry-related professionals, and then the uh, tech individuals. So we do have three different tiers depending on what type of, uh, if you're, like I said, if you're an individual or if you're an integration company. And, and each one of those comes with, again, just like TCD, it comes with different uh, benefits. Okay. Are discounts involved in that? Uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the, I believe the pricing is for integration company is 500 a year, uh, industry related professional, um, you yeah, got me on a, on a tight one here, I think is, is 500 or 250 and the tech individual right now is, is 250. Um, mm -hmm. but we're working on, um, some changing of some structures based off of what we're seeing in the industry right now. Are you guys going to be doing this presentation in September at CDA? Yes, we'll be doing it live at Expo, um, two sessions, uh, and there'll be not only a live presentation, but also uh, the ability to do hands-on uh, testing, which we've we've never done before. So in the in the classroom, you'll be able to get hands-on with the software if you haven't touched uh, used it before. Um, and then we also have uh, video recordings of Guy doing demos. Our most recent one was last month. Um, we have it uh, in English and in Spanish. Uh, on the TCD website. And then um, there is a free training in our CD Academy um, that's, uh, you don't have to be a CD member. All you have to do is have a CD account and you can log in and it's a step-by-step -step walkthrough of the of the software. And you would uh, recommend this to installers because it would just make their, their job a whole lot easier? Yeah, 100%, just as Guy was explaining, um, you know, what this provides is sometimes in some companies as, a, as multiple employees doing multiple different um, jobs, and, and this brings it in. Um, so someone that has a baseline knowledge of, of cinema design and audio and video properties is able to come in and, and, and do a design for a customer within within minutes. And as far as, like, getting the other, like, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that I own that wasn't in the list. So how long, uh, what are those conversations like? Yeah, so we do have a spot on the website, um, on the TCD website, um, under brands. If you if you don't see, there's a link there that will basically allow you to email us. If there's a brand that, that you you know sell or install that's not in there, you can let us know. Um, and what we end up doing is uh, contacting the manufacturer directly, saying, "Hey, you know, this is this is what TCD is. We have some um, some of our users that are requesting your products to be in the database, and we'd love to talk to you about getting you in the database. Like I mentioned before, it is an opt-in um, from the manufacturers because they have to provide us um, not only a lot of the data, but we have to get um, digital. We have to get rights, digital rights to to use their logo and to you know, right. like the sales sheets that you saw at the very end of the um, the documentation. We need to get all of that information from them. So. It, it is a, a process, but the more people that request, um, you know, from their, uh, if they're their sales rep or their distributor or direct from the manufacturer and say, hey, we want you to be in the tool because we're using it and we love to have your products in there. And I, my, myself personally, a guy and a couple others are always on the phone with manufacturers trying to get new ones in the software and then also making sure that the ones that are in there are continuing to send us new products. Right. Awesome. You guys have anything else that? I'm sorry. What was that? Do you guys, do you guys have anything else to add, Guy? Uh, no, no. That's that's it for me. That's that's been brilliant. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I I did see a question of what version was used. Um, mm -hmm. Guy was using the most recent uh, version, which is 2.9, which is live uh, yeah. now. Um, and um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, TCD at cd.org is is how you can reach out to the whole TCD team. 
So yeah. the um, it's always going to be up to date since it's like online, right? So yeah, nothing yeah. to download. Yeah, nothing we, to we download. Might... Is we, there a version to download? No, it's all it's all cloud based. It, we we literally probably make updates three times a week, so it's we're constantly working on it. So you're not going to have like a download. So let's say you're out in the boonies somewhere, you just don't have internet connection there. Then what do you do? Mm. Like if you're out in the field, um, I don't know how installers do it, but if you're out in the field and you need to make some changes or something like that, how's that? Um, how's that I would. Um, we've never re well, I have been asked that before and what I would probably tether my laptop to my phone or something like that. I would do something for either on an iPad with a four or five G card or, you know, something like that. But, but the largely what we're doing here is, is, um, all cloud based because we can change it. We can keep it and it's behind a firewall and we're not sending executable files out to people. And, you know, it's just, just better. And if we're, we're the custodians of everything from the source code to the, to the database would it's you say the, if you, yeah go ahead i would say also the database um is massive um we would be talking um you know tens of gigabytes uh on top of that we there are multiple servers with what guy created and the ability to do the 3d renderings and and the cad files so fast we have servers that, uh when the process starts that reach out reaches out to multiple servers does all of that processing all at the same time. So it would be really, really difficult for us to do that on someone's personal PC. Right, right, right. All right, makes sense. Um, would you say if you were going to, like if you were a DIYer, you just wanted to sign up um, for CDN and just get that free room, the, like the entry-level one, do you think you would, uh, for that kind of person, would that be more cost savings doing it that way than paying an actual installer? It's, it's funny you say that because somebody had joined CD the other day and uh, and I'd actually taken a screen grab of it and sent it to Ian. It said something like, um, it's worth the membership alone or something like that. It was some, you know, th two or three paragraphs that said, you know, I would join CDO just to get this. So uh, right. that was quite nice for us. I, um, you know, that it's a that's a great question, Shane. I, 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 it's a two an two part answer to that. One, um, I always, you know, recommend integrators whether they're cdm members or not a, a well a well-trained integrator is going to have that not only the the knowledge um, certifications and experience to provide the best system but um if if a you know a, a diy or end, end user is has is um has enough knowledge or is ambitious enough to maybe go take some of the education that is recommended to 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 have i mean what guy talked to you about a lot of those calculations and the uh, measurements and everything, you know, does require some knowledge to kind of understand what's going on there. Um, so if, but if, if a DIY or end user is, has the ambition to take some education and understand what's going on, more power to them. It's, it can definitely save a lot of time and money. Um, but for me as a CDA employee, I always recommend, um, you know, utilizing a, an integrator and, and especially one that's probably got some CDS certification. I got to throw that in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Got you. Got you. All right. So unless you're super knowledgeable, then get yourself an installer, it, I guess. You know, and, and I will also say that it, uh, even if it's, uh, it's uh, a, a DIY and user to, to just, if they're really interested to get in and just play around, um, and have fun with it. I know, I think someone said they just wanted to get in and play with this in the comments and it is, you can, I mean, Guy has seen some really amazing creative um, uh, designs. I know every once in a while we're on a call and he's like, man, this one, someone just came up with this design we never thought thought about. Um, so there is a lot of things you can do, a lot of crazy configurations and it is, um, can be pretty fun to play with. Plus, plus it, I think it'll give you like a good baseline, you know, if you're a DIYer to, to yep. kind of work from there. Uh, or even use it as a comparison if you want to create your own, and then if you get some um, some uh, bids from an integrator and and want to use it as something to compare against. So could you uh, could you do that? Download all the info, shop that that uh, PDF or whatever whatever it comes uh, around to see what the best cost. Absolutely. Is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you know what, if a DIY person knows what products they want. Um, then they absolutely could create their own system, go to an integrator and say, hey, I've, I've created the system. I'd like to see if, you know, you have the ability to price it out and let it, let me know what it would cost to, to install it and, and, 
and complete it 100 percent all right man i think that wraps it up unless you got something else to add I, i'm good guy i'm good thanks that's great thanks right, a lot yeah so you guys can check this out at cedia.net slash tcd slash tcd dash home for all the features training stuff like that get yourself a cd account and build your own home theater if you're a DIYer or a listener if you want to pit some installers against each other and download this and ship it away and get the best deal you can do that too but uh guys yo thanks for thanks for coming on the podcast today and don't forget to like share subscribe we'll see you guys again in the next one